stay. Now you be a good boy today, okay? Welcome to Talk on Things and Stuff. All right, today, continuing the Spring 2021 General Conference Countdown with Yu-Gi-Oh! But he's not the star of the show. No, the star is Radio Free Mormon. How are you doing, RFM? We're doing the Sunday morning session today. And yes, Yu-Gi-Oh! We is are. Rumble. I'm really excited, but any show <laughs> that you... Course- Okay. I'm very confused at this okay. point. You are a problem, mister. Any show that okay. Yu-Gi-Oh! Hold is on. in, Yu-Gi-Oh! Now, he's is up the my star audio. of... Hey, you stop it! Okay, hold on. You're going to have to calm down. Yu-Gi-Oh! Okay, for those who are listening to this on audio only, I want you to know Jonathan's talking to his dog right now, not to me. Okay. I don't think he's talking. Are you talking to me? Are you <laughs> no, no, talking no. to me? He is. He. These things have like crack cocaine in them or something. He's like totally crazy. This is a new treat. Okay, that's it. If you don't calm down, you're gone, Yugs. All right. All right. I'm just going to give him, maybe he'll get drunk on it and like fall over in a stupor. Okay, let's, I don't want to delay it any further because we got a lot to get to. <clears throat> RFM. Yes, we do. What do you got for us? Well, just the Sunday morning session of 2021 April General Conference is all. <laughs> Okay, well, let's dive right into it because we have a lot to cover and we've only got two hours today. We do. And if we don't get to the end, that's fine by me. Okay, because we can always pick it up okay. later. I think the most important thing, Jonathan, is to have fun. Uh, absolutely. And because, uh, we've already started there. Because <laughs> no, because we are putting the fun back in general conference. Conference. Okay, let's do it. Well, All right, okay. so we've got... Uh, by the way, by the way, I, you might say yeah. I'm playing with something in my hand. Yeah, what is that? What this is, is something that, it's like a, a keychain. It's a keychain. There's no keys on it at this point. But the son of a listener to the show made this keychain on a 3D printer, which always sounds so exotic uh, to me. But I guess if you know how to do it, it's probably easy. But I've got no idea. But anyway, I wanted to show this the special keychain <laughs> that was Lazy made by learner. the son. Yes, hashtag lazy learner is inscribed upon this beautiful green keychain. So just want to make sure everybody can see that there. Oh, by the way, by the way, general conference. This happened on Easter. So we've got the Sunday morning session of general conference. It's on Easter. And there's a number of things that are going to happen. And why don't we just talk about the special structure of this morning session of General Conference, which was apparently created by the dictate or the deep desire of President Nelson. And we have President Oaks who's conducting at the meeting and he tells us how it's gonna be structured and why. And this is specifically the Sunday morning session. Do you have that clip there, Jonathan? I do, this is from the, you won't be able to find it if you go to the first talk of the session, but you actually have to go to the one that has the entire session all in one block because Oaks stands up and gives some introductory comments. That's President Um, Oaks to you, pal. Oh, that's right. Uh, Dolan H. Hoax. Okay, let's see here. (laughs) There he is. Yes, all right, let's see what he has to say. Desire to have speakers. Hold on, hold on, we gotta have, it starts out with some, uh, <clears throat> international Korean. Those are yes. Korean kids singing about the temple in their native Korean. They're each dressed to the nines and they're cute as buttons for those of us who cannot see this. Yeah. Ending with a shot of the angel Moroni at the top of the temple. Yes. And a smiling Elder Oaks. On this beautiful Easter morning, President Nelson expressed a great desire to have speakers from throughout the world preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. We will begin by hearing from Elder Ulysses Soares of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, who is a native of Brazil. He will be followed by Sister Reina Isabel Alberto, Second Counselor in the Relief Society General Presidency, who is a native of Nicaragua. Elders S. Mark Palmer of New Zealand and Edward Dubay of Zimbabwe will then address us. They are both serving in the Africa South Area Presidency 
and their messages were recorded previously. There we go. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, that is not a fake smile, by the way. That is not no. a fake smile we're seeing on the screen. <laughs> that is a smile of someone who's very happy that he's alive and he's presiding in general conference on Easter Sunday. Not presiding, I'm sorry, conducting. It's President Nelson yes. who's always presiding because this is not, repeat, not a legalistic religion. Yes. So I wanted to say a couple of things about this. First off, I think this is great. I thought that was a, a nice idea. You know, let's do something uh, different. And so what mm -hmm. President Nelson did, he had a great desire, not a deep desire. It was a great desire to hear the gospel preached by all these different people throughout the world. And eventually, by the time that President Nelson takes the stand at the end of this session, he will note that we have heard speakers from every one of the six inhabited continents on the world, in the world. And so I think that's great. We've got diversity going on here. When I first heard this announcement live, I thought, this is really great. And then I started hearing the list of speakers and I thought, oh, well, these are just the same old uh, general authorities and officers we'd be hearing from anyway, but they've been sort of picked around from different places in the world for this one session. Mm -hmm. So there's a number of things going on. First off, I think that's a good thing. I will also say that I could not escape the image in my mind of President Nelson sitting there because it was his desire that he hear from people from all over the world in the session, preach the gospel. And you know that whatever Lola wants, Lola gets. Lola gets. <laughs> yes. And little man, little Lola wants you. So he desires it. He gets it because he's President Nelson. And this is what's, oh, it's sort of like, um, uh, you ever see the Nutcracker? Everybody's seen the Nutcracker, right? I've and fallen some, asleep to it several times. To it? Well, I'm talking about watching it while you listen. Oh, it's, it's a ballet. Oh, which one? Oh, okay. It's a ballet. It's a ballet. Uh, Tchaikovsky did the music. The original choreography was yeah. done by Marius Pettipaw. I believe, but of course, different choreography since. Anyway, in some versions of it, the way it's done is after about the first uh, act or so, uh, the Nutcracker turns into the prince, takes um, uh, Clara, I think it is. I don't think it's Clarice. That's Silence of the Lambs. Clara, back to his, that would be interesting. Silence of the Lambs meets Nutcracker. Um, but he takes her, her back to his kingdom, right? And he sits on a throne with her at his side and he watches uh, different representatives of his subjects dance before him. There's uh, the Arabian dance that gets uh, presented before him, uh, the Chinese dance, the Spanish dance. Uh, a lot of times there's Russians who dance. And there's this whole it's like idea. A survey of his kingdom or something. Exactly. It's kind of like Yertle the Turtle that my dad used to read to me when I was a kid. Everybody who gets that will get it. Everybody who doesn't will go, what the heck? But you're the turtle who's the king of all that he sees, all he surveys. Yeah. And uh, couldn't get that image out of my mind. So that's that's the flip side. And I don't think that that's necessarily what President Nelson is doing here. Uh, but the, the image is there. So the other thing is this, is that he's got like seven people who are going to talk. And I, I didn't count, but I've, I've gone through all of their talks with some detail, listened to them a number of times, read through them. And what ends up happening is, Unfortunately, when you have seven people all talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ in the LDS church, what comes into stark relief is the fact that the subject of the doctrine of Jesus Christ in the LDS church is so thin that it really doesn't withstand seven people talking about it uh, in one session of general conference. I know a lot of people will say, well, I want to hear about Jesus more in church. Well, this is what happens when you hear more about Jesus in church. It is difficult for any one speaker, even though they're only talking for like eight minutes each, in order to cram them all in to get them, you know, all these different speakers in from around the world before President Nelson speaks. Um, it is difficult to, uh, for one speaker, even in eight minutes, to not repeat themselves when they're talking about Jesus. And when you've got about seven speakers, boom, 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 one after the other, it becomes obvious that Mormons have very little interesting to my mind or nourishing or spiritual to say about Jesus. That's just one uh, man's opinion here. And so having said that, Jesus has, of course, we know he's resurrected. It's Easter morning uh, and his resurrection, everybody gets resurrected and through the atonement, everybody has a shot at eternal life. You know how that goes, he, right? 
Yeah, and he's the first one that ever gets resurrected, except for Lazarus, but we don't talk about that. Well, that's because Lazarus probably, we're sure he died later. Oh, okay. Yeah, that wasn't the real he resurrection. He didn't, get, he didn't get resurrected to eternal life. No, James Talmadge covers that in Jesus the Christ. I'm surprised you didn't know that, Jonathan. <laughs> I, just, I just like to put in the jabs there. Oh, my gosh. So anyway, but, but really what happens is, is that Jesus, uh, what gets repeated over and over and over again, is that he, he loves us more than anything, that he feels all of our pain because he's experienced everything that every one of us has ever experienced. Uh, spiritually, sin-wise, uh, physically, mentally, emotionally, medically, everything he has experienced. And therefore, he can sucker his people and he can help them out when they're going through these things. The thing that comes to mind, though, is that if you listen closely, if Jesus were a superhero, his superpower, his main superpower is this, is to help people feel better about all the shit he's raining down on them. That's what he does. And this is according to the talks that you will hear in general conference. Um, I'm not, and I'm not even sure he does that good a job about helping people feel better about all the stuff. But that's what we hear his superpower is, is that all this bad stuff is happening. And apparently he's behind it or at least letting it happen. But he's going to make us feel better about it. And he'll bring wonderful things to happen, even out of these tragedies in our lives. And that's one of the things here in general conference in this session. Have you ever been to general conference, Jonathan, and kind of felt down afterward. Oh, that frequently happened, especially after the priesthood session where, you know, as a young teenage boy, I, I knew they were talking about me whenever they brought up like your sins of factory maintenance and everything. I was like, no, they got me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and then when they would talk about not doing terrible things to your dog with a fork. Uh, I don't know that that ever came up. Like, <laughs> so, yeah, so we've got general conference and um, I have felt down many times after general conference, after a session. And I'm kind of wondering why, why do I feel down? This is supposed to be spiritually uplifting, but I feel kind of the opposite. And this is a classic example, this entire session of why it is that sometimes you can feel down after a session of general conference and not know. And that's because every story they tell, Virtually every story they tell is a sad story. Well, is this, I, I think people that look at uh, the Christian message as a healing one may frame the type of trials that you have differently from somebody who is um, looking at religion as a whole and saying that religion breaks you or tells you you're broken and then tries to sell you the cure. And that's whether or not they attribute all of the badness in your life as something that God is causing uh, or intentionally not preventing versus something that um, is just part of the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune that everybody has to deal with in life and, and finding a way to um, to deal with those in a, in a hopeful and uplifting and progressive way. I don't know if that makes any sense to you. No. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But you'll see what I mean. The, the sad stories are sad. The happy stories are sad. Everything's oh, okay. sad. The snozberries taste like snozberries. And this reminds me, I know we're doing a big intro here, okay? I'm sorry, but... The big intro is this, is that um, first off, the, the talks about Jesus are extremely thin and repetitive, but there are some stories that they tell, which is what we're mainly going to focus on, these sad okay. stories. And the other thing is that uh, about 10 years ago, there was a Chinese uh, foreign exchange student living at the house. And he's in high school, so he's 16, 17. He's a great guy, wants to be involved in everything American. And I did not suggest that he come to church. Believe it or not, I was not being a good Mormon and trying to manipulate him into coming to church with us for the, with the hope of his getting baptized, right? Mm -hmm. But no pressure, no pressure. But he came along anyway because he wanted to experience everything. So it's the first Sunday. It's September, first Sunday of the school year. And he's in sacrament meeting with me. It's fast and testimony meeting. He's never had an experience like this before in his life. He speaks pretty good English. So we can understand what the people are saying. And we get that. By the way, this is a totally standard fast and testimony meeting. There's nothing unusual about it from a Mormon's point of view. So it's nothing to me. And we get done and closing prayer, closing him. And I talked to him. I said, so what would you think? And he says, hmm, why is everyone so sad? Yeah. 
And I just laughed because I had not thought of it that way. But, you know, all of a sudden he says that and they go, yeah, everybody's sad. Even when they're testifying about how happy they are. Because yes. of all the blessings they receive from the gospel, they're up there crying. And these are not necessarily tears of joy. It's a very strange and confusing type of message. And he was picking up on it. So this is the same kind of yeah. thing that's going on here. So, by the way, are we ready now? Let me just double check and make sure I've done all of this long intro correctly, because I've got so many notes up here. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is great. Okay, so the very first talk now is going to be given by Elder Ulysses Suarez, who is a member of the Quorum of the Twelve, but because he's getting lumped in with all of these other speakers from around the world, he only gets eight minutes instead of the customary 15 that an apostle is supposed to get. Hmm. I don't know if this caused any, any trouble among the ranks, but I doubt it. He seems like a pretty humble soul. So his talk is called Jesus Christ, the Caregiver of Our Soul. He starts this uh, number of speakers talking and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if we can go to timestamp 558, by the way, before you start playing that, the other thing that is hovering over this conference, once again, is this whole specter of the pandemic. And the pandemic gets mentioned a number of times and people are dropping right and left because of the pandemic. That's some of the sad stories that are told. Um, but of course, the thing that's hovering in the background is the two days of fasting and prayer from a year before that President Nelson told all the saints, invite everybody in the world on two separate occasions, fasting and prayer to God to turn away the pandemic. First one didn't work. So President Nelson says, well, you know, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. And he calls on everybody to do, to do a second day of fasting and prayer. And then that didn't work as evidenced by the fact that it's a year later now. And we're recording this, by the way, on May 28, 2021. But this is from Easter of 2021 when this uh, conference is given. So that is also in the background here. And it's a very interesting dynamic that's going on and an example of why it is that a lot of times when you're looking at talks that are given or things that are written, it is helpful to know the historical context behind them in order to understand better what it is that's being said and why. So here we go to timestamp 558 and we get this uh, first reference here to the pandemic. OK, so RFM, I realized while you were talking that there's an audio issue every time I connect to the uh, video, it cuts out my headphones. So I had to while you were talking, route a different way to do it. I'm just going to switch over to that real quick. Well, that's why I was talking so minute. much to give you a chance to do that. You did, Jonathan. You did good. <laughs> I was just covering for you. <laughs> All right. You are a consummate professional. All right. So I'm going to hit share, stop screen, share, and share screen. And we're going to share a window. And we're going to get the Safari window and share that. I'm going to do a close of this. Do you know what I learned in school today, Jonathan? What would you learn? sharing oh okay so uh you know, um, <laughs> yugi's cracking me up <laughs> crazy. okay so i'm gonna do a test real quick i'm gonna see if you can hear this here we go and afflicted but okay so and i can still hear you say something i'm saying something okay no it did cut off you let me just try this here i'm gonna delete this and delete this and i'm going to go there and there. We may be lucky to get through the first talk tonight. Okay, I'm just trying to make it so that I don't have to reset my headphones every time we do something. All right, RFM, say something. I'm saying something right okay, now. So I lost you there. I've been lost. Okay, so all of this started about a month ago when I got a different headset because I lost this one. And now this one has, it's newer, but it has more problems. So... We're working out of technical difficulties okay. on the air, folks. I hope that you will bear with us. And I'm just impressed that Jonathan knows how to do all this stuff. It's way beyond me. And it's looking like it's way beyond Jonathan right now. Okay, let's try one more time. Me talking? Can you hear me? I'm talking right now. I'm talking. Okay. Um, Does that mean you didn't hear me? Why am I having this problem? Hmm. Okay, well, it's not like there's thousands of people watching or anything. Hold on, audio, move back. Yes, turn that on. Okay. Perhaps I just should just start singing uh, whatever Lola okay, wants, Lola posted gets. Somebody that they bear all things, and that's that's a good thing that Mormons are able to do that because... No, it says uh, we bear all thing a lot to have to bear. That says okay, we bear so, all thing uh, a. Let's see here. I can 
I've rebooted both of my Bluetooth system. I'll do that again. We're rebooting now, folks. You know, part of that song, whatever Lola wants, that President Nelson could be singing, because whatever he get wants, he gets. Audio there, we've got. Is the bridge of the song where it goes, I always get to what I aim for. And your heart and soul is what I came for. Okay, okay. okay. I could actually hear myself there in the echo. <laughs> it was, your dulcet tones were. It didn't help my singing okay. at all. <laughs> okay, I'm going to do a test now. I think I got it fixed. We'll see. All right, everybody, cross your fingers, hold your hearts. He was. I heard that. Hear I can now. hear that. Can you hear me? Okay, and I can hear you. All right, oh, we are fixed. Ha, ha, ha. You're okay. brilliant. Uh, people who have borne all things, thank you. That was the most okay, exciting so technical difficulty I've ever seen. Okay, so we are at timestamp. Remind me again. Okay, hang on a second, folks, because now we've got Ulysses Suarez. Of course, I lost you again. So I'm going oh, to pull that shoot. up to 5:58. Yes, sir. And um, can you hear me? Uh oh. The eight and while these, I'm going to go get a different headset that will avoid this problem. So, uh, in the meantime, can you hear me, RFM? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, I'm going to hit play, and our, we're going to go to that part. All right, here we go. And weaknesses of mortal life, including the circumstances we have experienced recently in the current pandemic. I can assure you that Christ is ever aware of the adversities and experiencing mortality. He understands all of the bitterness, agony, and physical pain, as well as the emotional and spiritual challenges we face. The Savior's bowels are filled with mercy, and He is always ready to succor us. This is possible because He personally experienced and took upon Himself in the flesh the pain of our weakness and infirmities. Okay, there you go. Oh, you got it. Are you? Can you hear me? Hmm. Okay, can you hear me? I can. Okay, great. So that is an example right there of the idea about the current pandemic, that the Savior, he understands, he knows exactly what we're going through. He understands all of the bitterness, the agony, the physical pain, as well as the emotional and spiritual challenges we face. That's a quote from his uh, talk there that he just said. And he also says, the Savior offers us relief and comfort as we face our afflictions temptations and weaknesses, including uh, those that we have experienced recently in the current pandemic. Well, of course, this begs the question, doesn't it? If Jesus knows about all of our troubles and all the problems that we're going through and deaths, by the way, and tragedies that are going on, which will be referenced in, in different talks caused by this pandemic, if he's there to offer us comfort, I mean, couldn't he just like uh, short circuit the whole process and have honored either one or both of the days of fasting and prayer and turned away the effects of this pandemic in the first place. That would have seemed the easier way, perhaps the more effective way of comforting us and dealing with the tragedies from the pandemic. Your thoughts, Jonathan, I don't even know, are you in a place where you can give your thoughts? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I struggle like it, I think it's very easy to look at those types of internal contradictions and be critical of the church um, and religion in general. I I see religion as um, you know some aspect of it is finding ways to muster hope and um, in the face of adversity, and this to me is just an expression of that, and that's something that you find in in all sorts of different traditions. Um, I don't know. It, it, I think if you keep it solely as ways to find hope and, and resilience in the face of adversity, it's fine. But as you allude to, they are not just that. They're also asserting some sort of healing power uh, through fasting, through their blessings of healing. And that in and of itself kind of taints the whole thing because they're they're basically just on one end, 
they're going to exploit religiosity to have you find hope. And on the other end, they're going to exploit your dependence on them in order to be healed or not be healed or have faith not to be healed. And all of it points back to continuing belief in them and their authority and obedience and all the other things that go along with it. So right. And this next uh, feelings. <laughs> it sounds like you're ambivalent. Uh, next one is going to be timestamp 7.51. But before we start playing that, I will note that right before this, he does reference that healing power because it's always this mixed message going on. And that's one of the reasons why it's so hard to actually understand or make sense in a cohesive and overarching way out of a lot of these talks. What he says is, furthermore, we will receive the strength we all need to overcome the hardships, weaknesses and sorrows of life, which are exceedingly difficult to endure without his help and healing power. Yeah. You see, you have both of those things there. So I guess you're sort of hedging your bets. You know, he's got healing power, but if for whatever reason he doesn't heal you, then he's going to uh, make it uh, comfort you or some something during this difficult time. All right, let's give it a go. Yeah, here's a story. Here's the first two people dying of COVID-19 because God did not honor the two days of fasting and prayer. Near the end of last year, I learned of the passing of our dear couple, Mario and Regina Emmerich, who were very faithful to the Lord and passed away four days apart from one another due to the complications from COVID-19. One of their sons, who is currently serving as a bishop in Brazil, related the following to me, and I quote, it was so difficult to see my parents depart from this world in that condition. But I could clearly feel the hand of the Lord in my life amidst that tragedy because I received the strength and peace that transcended my understanding. Through my faith in Jesus Christ and his atonement, I received divine help and strengthen and comfort my family members and all those who helped us during this trying experience. Even though the miracle that everyone hoped for did not occur, personally, I am a witness of many other miracles that we have, that have occurred in my own life and in the lives of my family members. I felt an expl inexplicable peace that penetrated the depths of my heart, giving me hope and confidence in the love of the Savior for me and in the plan of happiness of God for his children. I learned that on the very most grief-filled days, the loving arms of the Savior are always extended when we seek Him with all our heart, power, mind, and strength. And there we go. End of quote is what he ended up by saying. Okay, so this is a great example of how this plays out in conference talks. And I'm hearing just a bit of a, an echo there. I think you already took care of yeah, it. Yeah, no, every time I stop the video, I have to reset my headset. So just give me a second. <laughs> Absolutely. Go you want to just continue it. talking? That's yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, I'll, it'll, it'll just be a little blip and then you get to keep going. Okay, thanks. So we've got these two people, Mario and Regina Emmerich, and they are described as being very faithful to the Lord. Okay, that's important. They're Latter-day Saints. They're very faithful. And yet they pass away due to complications from COVID-19. So once again, if God had answered the saints' prayers a year ago and the days of fasting and prayer to turn away COVID, this would not have happened to Mario and Regina Emmerich. Additionally, as they are faithful Latter-day Saints who would obviously have received priesthood blessings to heal them from their afflictions, mm. and yet those blessings did not work. Now, I'm assuming that they received priesthood blessings. Part of the tragedy of this that is not being described here, but which is assumed is that the parents then died in some degree of isolation yeah. from their family members. And that's really, and probably from each other. I don't know what the situation was. I'm assuming this was in Brazil where it occurred, but this is very, very tragic. But so I don't know if under the circumstances of the pandemic, if they were able to receive priesthood blessings directly, I'm sure the priesthood was invoked. I know that prayers were uh, put up in their behalf and everybody wanted the miracle that they would survive. In fact, he refers to that. He says, even though the miracle that everyone hoped for did not occur. Okay. 
So that miracle does not occur. They both pass away. They end up being two more enrollees in the General Conference death march. But what we understand then is that there is no help for the widow's son here. These people, even though they're faithful Latter-day Saints, even though we presume that as much priesthood power and blessings were given to them as possible under the circumstances, they nevertheless passed away. It's not something I'm making fun of. It's just something I'm pointing out as they pass away. They don't get the miracle they hope for, but the miracle that they do get is God makes them feel better about their parents passing away under these horrible situation, circumstances. Yeah. So that's how that goes. So that was an uplifting story, wasn't it? Yeah. It's a bit of a downer, but it's it's kind of funny because, you know, one of the things that I do uh, occasionally in my videos coming out, I'm having every technical difficulty possible, and I blame Yu-Gi-Oh for all of it. But uh, early in church history, one of the things that you can find is reports that these new Mormonites are eschewing medicine. They, they're they saying, you don't have to go see a doctor, you don't have to take medicine, the, them and their healing powers will heal you. And it's it's kind of probably would be an interesting and fascinating subject to do a whole podcast on specifically, which is the charismatic healing aspect of early Mormon church history, because it was a central part of the expression of priesthood power. And there was, um, it, it, it's kind of double-sided because they'll give blessings and if you, get better than they'll say they did it, even though it could just be, you know, a certain percentage of every sickness is going to get healed. That's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is this happens all the time in kind of religious manipulation is they get someone who's on the inside, a confederate, to pretend to have a certain ailment, and then the religious practitioner will practice the healing arts and they'll be cured. You know, this happened in Jim Jones. If you read the early stories about uh, exorcism, and you and I uh, covered exorcism before, that's another expression of that. And then um, the other thing is you have to also plant the seeds that people who expect miracles in terms of healing are themselves faithless, and they are full of doubt. And so there's an early, um, I believe it's a conversation in the early forms of the temple where they talk about if somebody tries to cut off a limb and tries to get you to heal them, then they are doubting and they are expecting a sign and that that's the sign of a wicked generation or something like that. And so you have wicked to- Wicked and adulterous. Yeah, <laughs> and, and that's a shield. So it, it's, it's like they wanna have the positive effects of when they happen to give a blessing and someone gets better, but then they also wanna shield themselves from people who expect it. And in this case now they're saying that if it doesn't happen, the, the hoped for miracle, then the miracle did happen. It's in the way that you were comforted and suckered in your grief for the loss that you have. Hmm. You know, that's very interesting because that's, you're right. I do remember, of course, that part of the temple and it's certainly in, I think it's Matthew, it might be chapter 12, I'm not sure about that, where it talks about it's a wicked and adulterous generation that seeketh after a sign and no sign shall be given unto it except for the sign of Jonah or Jonas as is written from the Greek transliteration in the New Testament. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the belly of the, the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. Right? Is that the sign that they're referring to? Well, he says, uh, well, Jesus says, you're not going to get any signs, but I'll give you one sign. I'll give you a sign, pal. And the one sign you're going to get is this one, is the sign of the Son of Jonas, because I'm going down into the earth. I'm going to be there three days, and then I'm coming back and look out. Yeah. So there's that. Yep. Yeah. And so now we go to The Grave Has No Victory, which is the next talk. This is by Reina Aberto, who is second counselor in the Relief Society General Presidency. She's the one I think was mentioned being from Nicaragua. And at the very beginning, oh, was that On this her? This glorious Easter Sunday. Yeah. Are That's okay. Children joyfully okay, sing. Sing on a golden so spring. Reason, okay, here we go. I'm starting it again. It starts at the beginning. On this glorious Easter Sunday, our children joyfully sing. On a golden springtime, Jesus Christ awoke and left the tomb where he had lain. The bands of death he broke. We are grateful for our knowledge of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And yet, at some point in our lives, we will have felt heartbroken after losing someone whom we love dearly. Through the current global pandemic, many of us have lost loved ones. 
either family members or friends. We pray for those who are grieving such loss. There you President go. Okay, so I just realized I didn't put her picture up on the screen, but uh, that was the audio, yeah. Okay. Well, I'm actually looking at my notes, so I didn't even know that. Notes, so I didn't even know that. So once again, here we have in her opening statement a reference to the pandemic. Now, notice how many people will talk about the pandemic, but it's like this unspoken rule, right? Nobody's going to mention the days of fasting and prayer because, I don't know, that could be uncomfortable. That could be a little awkward. But she does say, through the current global pandemic, many of us have lost loved ones, either family members or friends. We pray for those who are grieving such loss. So here we have the prayers that the prayers that were made a year ago to turn back the pandemic having failed are replaced with prayers for those who grieve over the loss of loved ones to the pandemic. Yeah. So that was my comment about that. Um, then no, we go I, to. I know you started out commenting on how there's a lot of negative stories here, but what I'm seeing as we go through this is if the church went through this Easter General Conference and didn't acknowledge the fact that there was a pandemic and that, you know, many, many people across the nation, across the world, all continents have lost loved ones, it would seem myopic. <laughs> And so I think it's to their credit that they're acknowledging that everybody is dealing with this hardship, whether it's a loss of uh, life or a loss of livelihood. Um, so I think they, they kind of have to do this, and it, it does have to be kind of a somber tone to their uh, conference in 2021 spring. Watch how, they, watch how they layer it on. Now we'll go to because <laughs> it's more than just – it's more than just um... – uh, the epidemic, the pandemic. And of course, they have to mention it. And you're right. And I agree with you. But now they're just going to layer it on and layer it on. She's going to go back to a story when she was nine years old to tell this heart wrenching story. And this is a bit long, but it's a story. So it's more interesting than just um, mm -hmm. sort of talking. Um, okay. uh, but the story is interesting because one of the things it does is not only this really sad story about her, her brother dying, her older brother dying when she's nine years old in an earthquake, but how it is that a desire and a missing of her brother ends up 40 years later becoming a revelation to her from the Holy Ghost that he is still alive beyond the veil. And then it becomes a knowledge that we continue to live after death. It's very interesting, this, this transition that she illustrates. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's take a look. The death of the Lord. When I was nine years old, I lost my older brother during a devastating earthquake because it happened unexpectedly. It took me a while to grasp the reality of what had occurred. I was heartbroken by sorrow, and I will ask myself, what happened to my brother? Where is he? Where did he go? Will I ever see him again? Back then, I did not yet know about God's plan of salvation, and I had the desire to know where we come from, what the purpose of life is, and what happens to us after we die. Don't we all have those yearnings when we lose a loved one or when we go through difficulties in our lives? A few years after, I started thinking of my brother in a specific way. I will imagine him knocking on our door. I will open the door. He will... Almost a dream helped me cope with the pain that I felt over losing him. The thought that he will be with me came to me to my mind over and over. Sometimes I will even stare at the door, hoping that he will knock and I will see him again. About 40 years later, during Easter time, I was wondering about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and started thinking about my brother. At that moment, something clicked in my mind. I remembered imagining him coming to see me. That day, I realized that the Spirit had given me comfort in a difficult time. I had received a witness that my brother's spirit is not dead. He is alive. He is still progressing in his eternal existence. I now know that my brother shall rise again at that magnificent moment when, because of Jesus Christ's resurrection, we will all be resurrected. In addition, he has made it possible for all of us to be reunited as families and have eternal joy in the presence of God if we will choose to make and keep sacred covenants with him. There we go. So a very interesting story. And once again, definitely a downer. No real miracle there being talked about, at least not as we commonly understand miracles. But 
her older brother dies in this earthquake and she talks about an imagining. She says that imagining, that's her word, almost a dream, she says, helped me cope with the pain that I felt over losing him. This imagining of his knocking at the door and wanting to and being there. And then she says about 40 years later, so 40 years has passed, it's around Easter time. She's thinking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. She starts thinking about her brother and I'm going right from her words right now. And at that moment, something clicked in my mind. And I remember, this is her line, I remembered imagining him come to see me. Now, first off, I think that's totally natural and normal for a person in her position to have these desires, have these wishes, have these imaginings of her brother coming and knocking on the door because she wants to see him again. She misses him. He was taken from her abruptly and permanently. And so, of course, this is natural. But then she says, at that moment, something clicked in my mind. I remembered imagining him coming to see me. And that day when this thing clicks in her mind, she realized 40 years after the fact that the spirit, that these imaginings of her were the spirit giving her comfort in a difficult time. And now this comfort goes to, I had received a witness that my brother's spirit is not dead, he is alive. So now this becomes a spiritual witness, this desire, this imagining of her brother coming to see her. So now it's a witness. And then she says, he is still progressing in his eternal existence. And then she says, I now know that my brother shall rise again. And all of this hinging on this experience from 40 years before when she had these imaginings about wanting to see her brother again. I found this very, very interesting and illuminating how in some ways a spiritual witness and a knowledge can be predicated upon something like this from 40 years ago, which uh, I suppose from an objective point of view might not look like a real witness from God and certainly nothing that could base a knowledge upon. Yeah. I mean, what she's relating is a very human experience. Like I, when I was 13, my dad, uh, two of my older brothers and my sister died in a car wreck. And I went through an extended grieving process. And 10, 15, 20 years after that happened, I continue to have dreams where my dad shows up. And, you know, a lot of the times it shows up and he was like, on a secret government mission and he just couldn't, he couldn't come back until then when his mission was over, but he's shown up and he's now part of our life again. And it's like a recurring theme in my imagination. It pops up every once in a while, even to this day, but that it's not tied to this particular faith. You could go to a non-Christian religion in some other part of the world where no one's ever heard of the resurrection story of Christ and talk to people who have lost loved ones and find a very similar story just because that is how our psychology manifests as human creatures. But to me, I saw this story and I totally get what you're talking about where it starts out as this kind of phenomenon where you imagine someone that you know was very meaningful to you sh showing up again in your remembrance in a dream and then suddenly it gets elevated to a vision it gets elevated then to a witness and a point of knowledge about the theological you know construct that exists there but to me all of that is just preamble to the very last sentence and what which was is that how mormon ta mormonism takes this stuff and gets you and that is that Christ has made it possible for all of us to be reunited as families and have eternal joy in the presence of God. And then the huge, big, fat if. If. This is the condition. It's if not much, will though. Choose to make and keep sacred covenants with him. And that is an allusion to not only baptism, but also the covenants in the temple. Because while the wider Christian world just sees the, a commitment to Christ as that, you know, baptismal covenant, um, or an expression to follow Christ. The Mormonism, it's not just that, it's also all the things that you're raising your hands, all the pantomiming and stuff that is continued to be contained in the Mormon ritual in the temple uh, going along with those covenants. And if you wanna see more about that, just take a look at the discussion regarding Senator Gordon Brown um, that you can find on the mm. Thoughts and Things and Stuff website or any number of the other discussions. So that's kind of the thing that hit me in the face. I could really connect with her story until that last sentence. And it's like, okay, that's how they take everybody's grief, everybody's yearning for family, and they twist it and use that manipulation to get you. Yeah. They don't want much, just your entire life. 
(laughs) (laughs) Sorry, because that's what it means. We will choose to make and keep sacred covenants with him. That means devoting your entire life and existence, everything you own or shall own, all your time, talents, and all that you will be and your very life, if necessary. Mm-hmm. to building up the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I think is how the covenant goes. So yeah, you're right. Good point there. Um, are we ready to go to Our Sorrow Shall Be Turned Into Joy by Elder S. Mark Palmer? Yes, we are. I think he's, uh, is he an Aussie? Sure or maybe he's I from New Zealand. Him. He has a wonderful accent. It is New Zealand. Ah, excellent. All right. So we're going to start with him at the very beginning, and I will cue it up. Several years ago, while attending meetings in Salt Lake City, I was greeted by our dear prophet, Russell M. Nelson. In his typically warm and personal way, he asked, Mark, how is your mum doing? I told him I had been with her earlier that week at her home in New Zealand, and that she was getting old, but was full of faith and an inspiration to all who knew her. He then said, Please give her my love and tell her I look forward to seeing her again. I was rather surprised and asked, do you have a trip planned to New Zealand soon? With thoughtful sincerity, he replied, oh, no, I will see her in the next life. There was nothing frivolous in his response. It was a perfectly natural expression of fact. In that private, unguarded moment, I heard and felt pure testimony from a living prophet that life continues after death. There you go. I was looking forward to President Nelson uh, telling him, now that's a knife. But apparently that didn't happen. Anyway, that's my Aussie joke for the day. This is another example here of a person who's probably who's going to die before President Nelson can see her. Apparent President Nelson doesn't know that. He's nice enough to ask her how his mom is doing. I guess he'd met her before. And um, but uh, he says, fine. But, you know, she's getting old and that he talks about, please give her my love and tell her I look forward to seeing her again. And then the speaker says, well, do you have a trip planned to New Zealand soon? And the response is, well, oh, no, I will see her in the next life. Okay. That seems like kind of an unremarkable thing to say. Uh, when I was on my mission, you know, we would uh, have companionships with all sorts of different missionaries throughout the mission. And frequently, when we were separated from a companionship, we might be friends, we might have developed a good relationship. But we would frequently, as when we're saying goodbye at the train station, we would always say, catch it in the reikai. And reikai is Japanese for spirit world. So catch mm-hmm. you in the spirit world. You know, that's what that's what it's about. We'll see you in the spirit world because I'm probably not going to ever see you again on this life. And this is what it reminded me of when President Nelson says, oh, no, I will see her in the next life. But to the speaker, this statement by President Nelson becomes um, pure testimony from a living prophet that life continues after death. OK, it just didn't strike me as that remarkable. It's one of those things that if a missionary says it to another missionary in Japan 40 years ago, and eh, it's not that remarkable. But if President Nelson tells it to you. Now it becomes pure testimony from a living prophet that life continues after death. Your thoughts? Well, it just points back again to in Mormonism, they are finding solace in the prophets. Whereas in the wider Christian world, they would never, you know, you don't look to like what your pastor said as proof of your hope for uh, eternal life or happiness. You look to Christ. And it's kind of that, by having that focus on Christ as a figure, you're never elevating some man to some degree of reverence that would then make it more likely for you to um, be exploited by them. Of course, Mm. you know, it still happens, but um, that's just, it's just a reflection again, how Mormonism is a Christian religion that very much elevates the man at the top right alongside Christ. And we're seeing that just reflected again and again, how in these stories on Easter, they're pointing to, the guy at the top. And yes, you know, every once in a while, there's an allusion to Christ. There's this really great cartoon by the naked pastor where it, it's it's all about Pastor Bob. And it shows this, uh, this picture of the sermon. And it's like, this is a Christian church. It's all about Christ. But then all the signs say, Pastor Bob, Pastor Bob. It's all about Pastor Bob. And it's like, yeah, it's a Christian religion, but it's all about Pastor Bob. And uh, that, you know, just reflects this type of paradigm for these religious authoritarian figures that try to just capture this part of people's lives. 
I had not heard of Pastor Bob. That's cool. By the way, Jonathan, I think your garments are showing. No, no, no. That's my, I got addicted to having a nice, comfortable undershirt as a Mormon. And so I still do that. So did I see my undershirt? Yeah. What does that say? Monster madness? The mis Oh, the madness of Mysterio. That's what he used to look like back in the early 70s, folks, when he had a bubble yeah. head. He didn't look as cool as, uh, was it Jake Gyllenhaal? Jake Gyllenhaal, yeah. Jake Gyllenhaal, okay. So anyway, yes, the madness of Mysterio. Um, so there's that story. Now, by the way, there's get out great, your- There's all sorts of great metaphor in the way they did that story in that Spider-Man movie anyway, just in terms of, you know, pretending to have power. It was great. Mm. Anyway, keep going. I love it. I love it. So, so now we've got another story. Everybody get out your Kleenex. Do you have your Kleenex I feel like there? President Nelson is like, okay, we want everyone from different corners of the globe, but we want them to really have really sad, tragic stories. You know, we really want to tug on them heartstrings so that we can, you know, give them the balm of Mormonism or something. Well, this is an extremely sad story. He's going to tell about his parents and how they had their little uh, toddler daughter died tragically uh, a long time ago uh, it's horrible it's horrible it's gut-wrenching but the good news right. is is that it ended up leading the dad to listen to the missionaries many years later and join the mormon church so it actually has a happy ending see this is how we we make happy endings out of these things if you don't have kleenex jonathan you're going to need it so you may just have to use Yu-Gi-Oh. well fortunately he's found a bone so he's gonna be okay all right here we go oh yeah my own faith had its beginnings following a time of sorrow. My father and mother were sheep farmers in New Zealand. They enjoyed their life. As a young married couple, they were blessed with three little girls. The youngest of these was named Anne. One day, while they were on holiday together at a lake, 17-month-old Anne toddled off. After minutes of desperate searching, she was found lifeless in the water. This nightmare caused unspeakable sorrow. Dad wrote years later that some of the laughter went out of their lives forever. It also caused a yearning for answers to life's most important questions. What will become of our precious Anne? Will we ever see her again? How can our family ever be happy again? Some years after this tragedy, two young missionaries from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints came to our farm. They began teaching the truths found in the Book of Mormon and the Bible. These truths include the assurance that Anne now lives in the spirit world. Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, she too will be resurrected. They taught that the Church of Jesus Christ has once again been restored on earth with a living prophet and 12 apostles. And they taught the unique and remarkable doctrine that families can be bound together forever by the same priesthood authority Jesus Christ gave his chief apostle Peter. Mum instantly recognized truth and received a witness of the Spirit. Dad, however, wrestled for the next year between doubts and spiritual nudges. Also, he was reluctant to change his way of life. One morning following a sleepless night while pacing the floor, he turned to mom and said, I will be baptized today or never. Can, I, can we break in mom here for a second? Because what had happened. Because this is kind of long, uh, this whole story. And certainly he's gotten over the most gut-wrenching part of it. I mean, can you imagine how imagine horrible, horrible that would be? How awful and how you would blame yourself as a parent for that happening for the rest of your life. I came perilously close to something like that happening to me. And I can, you know... Only imagine if it had actually happened and tragedy had struck. But, but the deal is this, is that this is going to end up leading to uh, the family, the parents, especially the dad, getting baptized. And so there is a good ending to this. There's sort of a post hoc ergo prompter hoc logical fallacy going on here, which means that because something is after the fact, it was caused by the fact. And of course, the original fact is the, the tragedy with Anne and her drowning. But then subsequently is the dad getting baptized. And there may be a connection between the two. There actually may be a connection between the two. But the idea is that, okay, um, in order to get dad baptized, God's willing to pull out all the stops and do anything he needs to do in order to make it happen. It's terrible because you would think God up there, if he wants this guy's dad baptized and he wants the family baptized, couldn't he come up with some other way? Is this really the only way? And in this way, Anne almost assumes a Christ-like figure role in the story that she has to be sacrificed in order for the family to be saved. I don't want to overthink this, 
but that is sort of where it leads at least it leads me um so now he goes on and he talks about um oh gosh the other, the other point to make here is that um what they're telling you is a very real human story of loss yeah. and then how the missionaries strike at just the right time but you have to understand that targeting people who have been destabilized by tragic events in their life is a classic manipulation technique and there's a you know i made a video of this called targeting the vulnerable where you listen to psych psychologists experts sociologists experts in the field of cult psychology who look at how just blatantly you know everyone would agree this is like a harmful destructive cult they have a strategy of targeting people at certain points in their life young adulthood when you just go to college you're out of your parents house for the first time people who've lost a family or loved one the death of a child all these different things are specific target points where you are vulnerable because you have felt great loss and you're looking for something and that's when they strike so this is just a story of a family who in a moment of vulnerability was targeted by a proselytizing organization that came in and took over the rest of their life. And I'll put a link to that video if you want to see it. It's in the comments. It's called Targeting the Vulnerable, and it's centered around a video by L. Whitney Clayton, who's using classic high-pressure sales technique to train missionaries how to locate vulnerable people and grab them with this message. That is all, again, centered around the, we can give you a cure for all of these things that are currently plaguing your life with a big fat if, and then you have to commit everything to the organization for the rest of your life. You say that like it's a bad thing. Well, you know, it, if, if they're going to supplant all of your values and priorities and choices and identity with their own made up crap, then it does happen to be a bad thing. Okay, now I've got to I've got to be you talking to me now, because of course they don't think it's made of crap. They think this is the truth. These are two missionaries mm -hmm. out in New Zealand. They've committed to two years of their lives, and so this is all absolutely true as far as they're concerned. So it does. Um, let's just we put it hold, this way: in this we story, all hold beliefs. Yeah, in this story, there aren't any bad guys. In this mm -hmm. story, with the different characters here, right? There's no bad guys. But this is what ends up happening, and this is why the story is told. In fact, he does make this connection explicit later on. I don't want to play the entire audio just because he goes on and on about getting baptized. But he does say, many years later, Dad told me that if not for Anne's tragic death, he would never have been humble enough to accept the restored gospel. So there is that direct connection. We lost you for a there. second, RFM. Say that again, starting from many years later, Dad. Repeat that because we lost Yeah, you. this is where he says, many years later, Dad told me that if not for Anne's tragic death, he would never have been humble enough to accept the restored gospel. Wow. So, but for God drowning Anne, Dad would never have been baptized. How do you deal with that as a dad? It's like, gosh, I was so arrogant and prideful that they had to kill my daughter to humble me. I don't know. Probably by not thinking about it in that way. Yeah. Probably by not thinking about it in that way. But you're right. That's a definite logical corollary to what he just said, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. So now we can go on to Pressing Toward the Mark by Elder Edward Dubay. And timestamp 145. Actually, let's not do that because that's going to take too long. That really doesn't fit with the theme. Let's go to 348, shall we? Because now he tells... Uh, a story about his mom who is battling cancer and uh, he wants her to be healed. He wants her to be relieved of the pain and it doesn't happen. And um, so she just suffers and then dies. All right. We lost you for a moment there. RFM. So she suffered. Her, her, <laughs> his mom's battling cancer. He wants her to be healed. Continue. Uh, but she doesn't get healed. He wants her to be relieved of the pain. She's in intense pain. And he wants her to be relieved of the pain. By the way, it's not clear whether he's a member of the church at this time. He doesn't make that clear. So maybe he's not. Uh, if he is, I imagine he's giving her priesthood blessings. If he has the Melchizedek priesthood, regardless, he's praying and wanting her to be relieved of her, of her pain, as any loving son would, right? Mm -hmm. As anybody would. But it doesn't happen. And she continues to suffer, and then she dies. 
And that's the story. But the lesson, the lesson that he gets from his mom in this is, hey, if God wants me to suffer, I'll suffer. It's a very fatalistic kind of attitude. There's no idea of an intercession being made by God to relieve either pain or cure or anything except this is God's will. So it's our duty to submit to it and go through everything that he wants us to go through, no matter how painful it may be. Okay. So we're going to go to timestamp 348 on uh, pressing towards the mark. Is that... Yeah. I say shall find it. In my first general conference address, I shared an experience of my mother teaching me to work in our field. Never look back, she said. Look ahead at what we still have to do. Towards the end of her life, while mother battled cancer, she lived with Naomi and me. One night I heard her sobbing in her bedroom. Her pain was intense even after taking her last daily dose of morphine only two hours earlier. I entered her room and sobbed with her. I prayed aloud for her to receive instant relief from her pain. And then she did the same thing she had done in the field years ago. She stopped and taught me a lesson. I'll never forget her face at that moment, frail, stricken, and full of pain, gazing with pity on her sorrowing son. She smiled through her tears, looked directly into my eyes and said, it is not up to you or anyone else, but it is up to God whether this pain will go away or not. I sat up quietly. She said, she too said quietly, the sin remains in my mind, vivid in my mind. That night, through my mother, the Lord taught me a lesson that will stay with me forever. As my mother expressed the acceptance of God's will, I remember the reason Jesus Christ suffered in the Garden of Gethsemane and on the cross at Gorogotha. He said, Behold, I've given unto you my gospel, and this is my gospel which I've given unto you, that I came into the world to do the will of my father, because my father sent me. As I reflect on... There you go. So that is a remarkable story. I mean, his mom says it's not up to you or anyone else, but it is up to God whether this pain will go away or not. Now, that's certainly a valid way of looking at things. There are many people who look at life and bad things that way. It's a very stoic kind of philosophy. The deal is this, though, is that in the LDS church, I mean, this is one message we're hearing in the LDS church, and this isn't the only time we hear it, whereas we just have to submit to whatever God wants to inflict upon us. Um, but the... Selling point, if I may put it this or that way, the selling point of the LDS church and especially the selling point of the priesthood is that we've got the power. We have the power to intervene and get God to do something on your behalf that would not have happened otherwise if God had not intervened. That's the only reason for having uh, prayer. It's the only reason for having sacrifice. Uh, which we do mainly by fasting nowadays, as well as tithing and all these other things, right? But that's the reason that we have priesthood blessings, is to try and have something happen that would not otherwise have happened, because if our priesthood blessing is just to uh, confirm that whatever is going to happen was, is going to happen anyway, there's really no point to them at all. There's no point to any kind of healing power. So here we have this idea that it's not up to you or anyone else, but it's up to God whether this pain will go away or not. Well, yeah, obviously that's true. But what about prayer? What about miracles? Well, apparently there are none in this story. And his mom tragically ends up being the third person to enlist in the General Conference Death March in this session alone. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. And that's, you know, you mentioned earlier how it's hard to get eight people talking about the gospel to not stumble and trip over each other. And I feel like just the local tradition of how you relate God and divine intervention to life's tragedies. Because this seems to be a very different approach than you'll see in, in other instances where there is an allusion to this power to call this, this ability to call upon the powers of heaven in moments of need. And for, you know, what is the point of a anointing and, and laying on of hands to heal the sick if that's not actually what's going on? As you, as you point out, that's not actually what's going on. It's just a confirmation of whatever God's will is anyway and helping you to deal with that. Yeah, we don't need this entire ritual that we have with priesthood blessings if they're not going to do anything. Because remember, you can't just use any olive oil, right? 
Well, first off, you right. have to use you have to use something. You have to use an oil. It has to be olive oil, and then you have to consecrate the olive oil, right? And that's a priesthood mm -hmm. ordinance. And then you got to get two Melchizedek priesthood holders together, so that first one can take the oil that's already been consecrated and then anoint the person with the oil. And then the second person, generally, it's a second priesthood holder, uh, yeah. lays hands on him with the other person and seals the anointing and then gives the blessing, right? Then gives mm -hmm. the blessing. We even call it a blessing. Yeah. So uh, it's a very strange thing that we have both of these messages that go on, but it does seem that more and more we're getting focused on the deal that um, having the faith to just suffer and die is greater than having the faith to be healed. And obviously yeah. that, that harks back to Elder Bednar from 2013 yeah. at the talk he gave at the University of Texas at El Paso, I think. But, but by the time we get to the last talk of this session, which may not be today, and that's okay, yeah. uh, by President Nelson, he's doing the same thing. He's actually elaborating upon this idea that was uh, originally, as far as I know, presented by David Bednar back in yeah, 2013. <laughs> if you were to take President Irene's talk from the last session and play it right next to this talk, this guy's talk is basically saying, President Irene, you're claiming that you performed a miracle to heal that little girl who got injured in the car accident. Well, God's going to heal who God's going to heal regardless of what goes on. So you kind of need to just calm down and simmer down on claiming that that was a miracle. You're right. He, that, you're right. That's a great point. Because putting those two messages together, this gentleman is telling President Irene that God was going to do what he was going to do anyway, regardless of your blessing. And it just so happened that it ended up uh, that she healed. She was healed after yeah. you gave her the blessing, right? Yeah. But the doctors were disgusted with him and told him to go away. Yes. Yes, they did. <laughs> Wouldn't you have liked to have been a fly on the operating room wall there? Yeah, that was interesting. Now we okay, get to so another story because he's not he's not satisfied having a third person in the Gen Con death march. He's going to add four and five. In this. I mean, they're dropping like flies out there. Timestamp 625. Here's another story. This one's a little bit more brief. Okay, let's do it. Recently, I had a conversation in Pretoria, South Africa, with a bishop who buried his wife and his adult daughter on the same day. Their lives were claimed by this coronavirus pandemic. I asked how he was doing. Bishop Ted Tabete's response strengthened my resolve to follow the words and counsel from the Lord's prophets, seers, and revelators. Bishop Tabete responded that there is always hope and comfort in knowing that the Savior has taken upon himself the pains of his people, that he may know how to suck us with deep faith he testified. I'm grateful for the plan of salvation, the plan of happiness. He then asked me a question. Is this not, is this not what our prophet was trying to teach us this last conference? What the okay, so there you got it again, right? You have a bishop in South Africa who buried his wife and his adult daughter on the same day because they died because of coronavirus and the pandemic. So once again, we have people who are ill. We've got to know that they were receiving priesthood blessings. Not only did the days of fasting and prayer from a year ago not avoid this, not only did priesthood blessings and prayer and probably additional fasting for them not avoid this, but they die Anyway, so there's a four and five just in the session alone in the death march. And once again, even though they are not saved, there is no miracle. There is no divine intervention through priesthood or other power on their behalf. The result is, and what the survivor, the bishop says, is that there is always hope and comfort in knowing that the Savior has taken upon himself the pains of his people, that he may know how to succor us. So once again, it's like, uh, how does that help really? Maybe it helps psychologically. And if it does help this bishop or other people, I'm all for it. But it just seems like there's no real intervention. And therefore, we manufacture some kind of intervention that cannot be measured or uh, seen. It's totally internal, right? So even though God let my wife and my adult daughter die in spite of my prayers and everything, and there was no intervention, uh, I'm going to say that, well, he feels my pain and therefore that is comforting in some nebulous way. Yeah. No, I, I hear that. It's funny because when you look at the broad 
landscape of all the different ways that they talk about these priesthood healing issues, there's an aspect of it that they're not bringing up anymore that used to be brought up, I think famously by President Oaks, which is that, you know, when a priesthood holder lays their hands and, and pronounces the blessing of healing, it is contingent on the faith of the person who is looking to be healed, whether or not that miracle comes. And they're not saying, they're not mentioning that in any of this, because what that is saying is that all these people who did not get that hoped for miracle did not have faith sufficient to, to, to capture the healing blessings that they were offered through the administration of the healing ordinance. Right. Uh, I don't know and if you remember that call. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So uh, there's all sorts of ways that we have of shifting blame for priesthood blessings that don't work. And it has to do with the faith of the person who's giving it or the faith of the person who is receiving it. But it never, ever, ever can go to the actual power of the priesthood to heal people. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. the one that's beyond question. We can't we can't talk about that. Um, and that's why it's also interesting when there are certain stories like one that was given previously. It talks about two people who passed away, that they were faithful. Right. Yeah. They're described as being very faithful members. So we can't blame their lack of faith on it. And they're getting yeah. a blessing from someone hopefully who has enough faith. You know, eventually you have to get down to the idea of why isn't God healing anybody? Why isn't he intervening in, in any way? And the answer ultimately is, well, he could if he wanted to, because he has the power to and he has the love to, but he's not doing it. So we got to come up with something else that he is doing. And what he's doing is he's comforting us even uh, in the tragedy that he could have prevented, but failed to. Yeah. I, I, it's helpful sometimes to like, if you're a Mormon and you're hearing this, you're like, well, you guys are just being too critical. You know, you, you're just trying to find fault. Let's just take the same pair. going to find healing as you rid your body of these thetans and all of the things that have plagued you all the grief all the negative thoughts all the terrible uh psychological impact of those thetans are going to be released and so you go through that pro you do that process and it doesn't work you're still plagued by all this negative you know thought processes and everything and they say well you're just not doing it good enough you know you're not really really invested in this process they'll blame everything and anything well maybe your auditor who was doing it didn't do it right or something they just won't blame the idea that the entire construct handed down from L. Ron Hubbard was itself a fiction and has nothing to do with whether or not you are healed and in some cases may actually make it worse when all the evidence points to that. That is a single explanation that makes sense of all of this without having to create, you know, other... On to the next talk. If you'll hang on just a second, because from a very Mormon point of view, I like the Scientology point of view too. But the Mormon point of view is if you read the Book of Mormon and pray about it and you don't get an answer, Jonathan, what's the problem? Well, you didn't pray with enough sincerity. You you know, you know you didn't study enough. You didn't pray hard enough. It's, it's all your fault. Right. It can never be that the Book of Mormon isn't true. No. It has to be you because you're doing something wrong. We already know the Book of Mormon is true. So you, obviously you are not... Uh, reading it, you're not praying, you're not doing it with real intent, all those other yes. things that you can shove off on you. Um, let's mm -hmm. go down to, now this is um, the next talk, Remember Your Way Back Home by Elder Jose, is it Teixeira? Do you know how to pronounce mm -hmm. that name? You're uh, closer Teixeira. to the border than I am. What? <laughs> uh, I, that one's got me. Tex T Teixeira. T-E-I-X-E-I-R-A. And he gives a talk, um, and uh, let's see, if we go to timestamp 2.04, because this isn't a sad story. This is just a timely reminder that we need to follow the prophet. Okay, 2.04, let's do it. In 1946, the young researcher, Arthur Hassler, was to our heavenly home. That Remind yourself of this heritage. Make time regularly to boost your spiritual immune system by remembering the blessings you have received from the Lord. Trust the guides you have been given from Him, rather than turning solely to the world to measure your personal worth and find your way. There you go. Recently, I visited a loved one after she... So, that was, uh, yeah. so trust the guides you have been given from Him. Who are these guides of which He speaks? 
Can you hear me, Jonathan? Now I can't. Go ahead. Yeah. He says, trust the guides you have been given from him. Who are these guides of which he speaks? Um, the prophets, probably. The scriptures. Yeah, totally. They're the church leaders. Rather yeah. than turning solely to the world to measure your personal worth and find your way. So trust God's guides to find your way, not the world to find your way. And this is the kind of thing that we hear all the time in general conference. I just wanted to point it up here. And now if you'll continue to play from recently, we have this strange story. Once again, it's a sad story, but it's about somebody in the hospital. And I end up with more questions about this than I have answers. It's a very short story, thankfully. Okay, let's do it. I'm going to rewind just a hair. Thank you. I visited a loved one after she had been in the hospital. Oh, she okay, told let's go right back there. Recently, I visited a loved one after she had been in the hospital. She told me with emotion that while she was lying in the hospital bed, all she desired was for someone to sing to her the song, I am a child of God. That thought alone, she said, gave her the peace she needed in that hour of affliction. Okay, no there you go. It's a strange story because this is, that's the story, right? Story, right. That's the end of it. He goes on to something else. This is the entirety of the story. So he's talking about he visited a loved one after she had been in the hospital. Now, once again, I have to say up front that with this whole coronavirus pandemic, it throws a twist into our understanding of these stories because it's possible that she was in a secluded area of the hospital, that nobody could get to her to visit her, to sing to her. I am a child of God. I wish that if that were the case, he would have made that clear. Because what it ends up sounding like is he has a loved one, right? Who's, she was in the hospital and he doesn't visit her until after she had been in the hospital, apparently. It says, recently I visited a loved one after she had been in the hospital. So once again, maybe it's because he couldn't go in the hospital to visit her. If so, I understand it, but it would have been helpful to know that. She told me with emotion that while she was lying in that hospital bed, all she desired was for someone to sing her the song I am a child of God. But according to the story, nobody ever sings it to her. And that's sad. But then, even though all she wants is for someone to sing her, I am a child of God. By the way, why doesn't she desire a blessing, Jonathan? The thought occurs to you. The, the thought occurs to one as I'm reading it. Why is it. Why is that all that she desires is for a song to be sung to her and not for a blessing? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know. There's a cynical answer and a realistic answer. I, I think realistically, you could say she may understand that because of coronavirus, people are not allowed to come in and lay hands. Yes. And and there is something, you know, when you talk about a proper priesthood blessing, it involves the oil, but also physical touch, not through gloves, physical touch. And so I think the church has struggled with that in the midst of the pandemic. Um, right. But there is and prayer and fasting. Other religions who have traditions involving direct administration of sacramental um, ordinances in terms of eating uh, sacred symbols, they're having to struggle with that as well because those things involve direct uh, contact. Um, but that, that to me, that's kind of what that invokes. What are your thoughts on it? Right. Well, there are other things such as prayer and fasting. Yeah. But what this events is, is an absolute... The story, the way it's told, I'm not trying to judge this lady, okay? But the story, the way it's told, evinces a complete lack of any uh, faith in any kind of healing power through any kind of activity or administration, whether it's prayer or fasting, whether it's priesthood blessings, whether it's anything, because the only thing that she wants is for someone to sing her the song, I am a child of God. In other words, something to comfort her while she's going through this thing that otherwise cannot be avoided through the intervention of God. And then he says, that thought alone, she said, just the thought of wanting someone to sing to her, I am a child of God, that thought alone, she said, gave her the peace she needed in that hour of affliction. So like I can say, it's kind of a strange story. I don't understand yeah. exactly I, what it well, means. Because yeah, that struck me at first. It's like, well, so just the need for someone to sing with her, that seems really weird. So I looked at it again. Is there a different way that's maybe more charitable to interpret what he's saying here? And I think what he's trying to say is that her thought about the principle of the song that i am a child of god her knowledge of herself as being a child of god is what gave her comfort and she perhaps would be reminded of that by someone singing it to her but the concept itself is what gave her comfort uh, and i and i can understand that i think that is a comforting thought to many people who who see their relationship with god in that paradigm 
Okay, very good. I like that. Timestamp 4.20 from the same talk gives us the obligatory warning about searching for information on the internet. <sighs> Great. All right, here we go. 420, blaze it. Here he is. To be prayerful. We live in a time when, with a single touch or a voice command, we can begin searching for answers on almost any topic in the immensity of data stored and organized in a vast and complex network of computers. On the other hand, we have the simplicity of the invitation to begin seeking answers from heaven. Pray always, and I will pour out my spirit upon you. Then the Lord promises, and great shall be your blessing, yea, even more than if you should obtain treasures of earth. There you go. So what I get, I have to give credit to the Mormons, okay? Because when it comes to this subject, at least they're not as heavy handed as the Jehovah's Witnesses. Yeah. And the Jehovah's Witnesses will come right out and say, do not be looking on the internet. That's bad stuff. It's a bunch of lies. They're really heavy handed. The Mormons give the same message, but in a gentler way. And can you see how he's giving that same message here, Jonathan? Yeah, I mean, it's they they use fear of being deceived um they use the whole otherness of sources that are not coming from the church cannot be trusted you know all these little things i think it's really interesting where he actually brings up voice command so he's alluding to alexa or google voice and he's saying you know you can search for it i just want to i want to try something out i haven't done this before but since we're live and he mentioned it hey google how many wives did joseph smith have See if it works here. Three wives. Here's a summary from the website npr.org. Joseph Smith had up to 40 wives. The two-way NPR. Okay. To find out more, look for the link in your Google Home or Google Assistant app. Could you hear that? Yeah. Okay. Hey Google. Did Joseph Smith married women who were already married? Sorry, I don't have any information about Let's that. Let's try. Hey See. Google. Did Joseph Smith practice polyandry? Sorry, I don't have any information uh, about that. The church has been hard at work. It, I I don't know. We're gonna have to we're gonna have to train Google. <clears throat> I think she's already been trained <laughs> by President Nelson. They've been having special sessions on the fourth floor of the Salt Lake Temple. Yes, <clears throat> it's called SEO. <laughs> Yeah, search engine, uh, search engine optimization. Oh my gosh! You know, I, I go to YouTube uh, on my phone to look up the Mormonism live show. Sorry, I'm not trying to do a plug for that, but the Mormonism live show, right? That I do with Bill Real every Wednesday night at 6:20 p.m. <laughs> Mountain Time. Uh, <laughs> but no, I go to Mormonism Live, right? And boom! Before we get to the first episode, there's like all these different ads from the church before you get to the actual Mormonism live episode. Yeah, that's great. So that's the the CEO, what is it, CEO? A SEO, search Not the engine CEO. optimization. Yeah, you know yeah. the church is buying lots, it's like anyone that's searching Mormonism, Mormonism live, Radio Free Mormon, we wanna hit them with ads for uh, the church, that way they can be shielded from the apostasy. Are you ready for another sad story? Uh, yes, let's do it. The closing song, I think, for this that I'll put on it is uh, Elton John singing sad songs. Say sad so much. Sad songs they sing, yes. <laughs> All right. Okay, here's another, but nobody dies, I think. I'm sure a lot of okay. people die, just nobody actually in the story. Are we at timestamp 610? Oh, yes. All right, let's do it. Uh, I will bring our good... Uh, somebody uh, helpfully said that the pronunciation is uh, Teixeira. There's See, like I thought that. it was that just sound, the X. Yeah, yep, 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 yep. Okay, so we're at that's time that, That's six. the extent of my knowledge of, of Spanish, except for um, Senor Delgato was a cat. Okay. <laughs> All right, here we go. Uh, and play. Hath a becoming like our savior. In 1975, as a result of a civil war, Arnaldo and Eugenia Tales Grillo and their children had to leave behind their home and all that they had built through decades of artwork. Back in their native country of Portugal, brother and sister Telles Grillo faced the challenge of starting all over again. But years later, after joining the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, they said, We lost everything we had, but it was a good thing, because it compelled us to consider the importance of eternal blessings. They lost their earthly home, but they found their way back to their heavenly home. 
whatever you must leave behind to follow the path to heavenly home will one day seem like no sacrifice at all. Okay, there you go. So nobody dies here except for all the people who died in the Civil War. But as far as Arnaldo and Eugenia uh, and their children, apparently they don't die, but they lose everything. They have to flee their country. And then years later, they end up joining the church and they ascribe uh, the loss of everything that they had uh, to being necessary for them to join the church. Yeah, it's another story where uh, loss and tragedy are justified by them leading you into the promised land of membership in the church. And not only that, but then you won't regret anything that you lost because of it. Right. And by the way, this this takes on a huge, uh, it's like the, the story about the drowning of Anne, excuse me, mm -hmm. that was told by the previous speaker. But this is actually ups the ante considerably because now God doesn't just kill one little kid in order to get the family years later to join the church and become Mormons, right? He actually causes an entire civil war in this story with countless people getting killed and injured and maimed and everything else that goes along with the horrors of war, especially a civil war for crying out loud. But God causes or allows the civil war so that this one family can join the church. Now that's commitment. <laughs> Now, come on, that's that's a little too cynical of a read of this entire thing, RFM. They just happened to be there in the Civil War. The Civil War could have been caused by any number of other things. It wasn't specifically so this family could get converted. Well, apparently he said, as was quoted in the talk, we lost everything we had, but it was a good thing because it compelled us to consider the importance of eternal blessings. They lost yeah. their earthly home, but they found the way back to their heavenly home. I'm having trouble reading it any other way, cynical or not, Jonathan. <laughs> well, I, I think it's one thing to say that they made the best out of a tragedy, but it's another th thing to say that the tragedy of the entire nation was inflicted on them so that this one family could learn the value of heavenly blessings. But that being said, I'm just I have to push back on you at some point so that I don't let the dark cloud of your cynicism take over the entire thing. Otherwise, I'll just steamroll through this. But th I mean, are you getting the, the sense now? Are you getting the flavor of why it is that after the Sunday morning Easter session of General Conference, you come out of it and you're feeling like your feet are dragging yeah. and your, your head's down and you're going, oh my gosh, I just feel so horrible now. I don't know why after hearing about all these terrible stories, but I feel really bad after General Conference. That's how I well, felt it's, anyway. Yeah, no, I hear you. The, the thing that he says at the end where he says, you know, whatever you've left behind will seem like no sacrifice at all because you've come to God's graces. You're doing what God wants you to do. And, and I'm reminded of the price that people pay throughout their entire life to conform to the religious edicts of these groups. And the story here may seem good, but just take that same principle and see how Jehovah's Witnesses do it, where... For them, the challenge of their faith is, oh no, their kid's been in a car accident, he's bleeding out, the doctors have come to me and said, we need to give him blood. But because my leaders have told me that Jehovah does not want us to take blood products, then I'm going to say, no, it's against my religion, my devotion to Jehovah is stronger than my desire to see my child healed, and so as the test of my faith, as a sign of my devotion, I'm going to say no, because obedience is the first law obedience to God. And it's the same exact paradigm. And then when those people who that has happened to then later learn that the claimed authority of the Jehovah's Witnesses was, was, was fake and made up. And then they look back on that choice, even though for a period of time, that choice may have been like it's no sacrifice at all. Suddenly they realize that they gave up something that was dear and precious to them in this world because of a delusion and a manipulation. And they, it will seem like a great sacrifice, like the greatest sacrifice. And just transpose that back now onto Mormonism. If, in fact, the men claiming these authorities, telling you how you have to shape your life around it, if their claim to legitimate authority is false, then suddenly these things that you've sacrificed will actually seem like a great sacrifice because you were sacrificing them to a delusion, not to uh, objective reality, not to your own personal priorities and values, and so that's a big thing. That's why this question of history, you know, are their claimed authorities real? Is there contradictions that impeach their claim to authority? All that is very important because it changes how you contextualize these things that you have sacrificed in your life 
in devotion and obedience to these men. So that's my rant on that. Mm, those are great points. Those are great points. If you can go to timestamp 4.20 in the same talk. Now, this is the guy who didn't get the memo about not talking about the, the worldwide fasting and prayer. He's the one guy. And even when he was giving this talk and I was listening to it live on Easter morning, uh, it, it jolted me. I thought, well, what are you doing? What, you're not supposed to be talking about this. Or, nobody else is talking about this. But he does do it in sort of a faith promoting way. So at timestamp 4.20, here's what he no, has to we, say. We've, we've already done timestamp 420 on this guy. Have we? That was that was at the single touch or voice command. Oh, no, no. I'm so sorry. It is in the next talk. So My apologies. I scrolled down. This about. is God Loves His Children by Taniella B. Yeah, Wakolo. That is, uh, that, okay, so you've gone on to God Loves His Children, Wakolo. I had not yet shifted there yet. So let me do that, and we'll go to time 420. I am racing ahead of you. I am a dot on the horizon. So 4.20 in the talk, um, God loves his children. All right, here we go. Tiny yellow with oh, his children. Recently, the words of President Nelson have been a source of strength and inspiration to the people of the Philippines. As with every country in the world, during 2020, the Philippines was severely affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as a volcanic eruption, earthquakes, typhoons, and devastating floods. But like a pillar of light shining through dark clouds of fear, loneliness, and despair, came the words of the prophet. It included the call for worldwide fasting and prayer and counsel to move forward despite the pandemic. He invited us to make our homes personal sanctuaries of faith. He called upon Latter-day Saints everywhere to respect all of God's children and to let God prevail in our lives. There you go. You know, what's interesting is that some of these speakers actually from Africa tend to be energetic and actually speak at a regular tone of voice such that when you increase the, the rate, which I know you've been doing, uh, it sounds really rushed like that one. And that's fine. That's fine. All I'm noticing is that the the normal speakers that we usually have, like the apostles and everything, they speak so slowly that when you speed it up, they sound normal. And these guys sound normal when they're talking. So when you speed it up, it sounds a little bit fast. Anyway, here's his mention of it, right? He says, but like a pillar of light shining through. Oh, by the way, he talks about Philippines first, which is, I think, where he's from. Um with every country in the world during 2020, the Philippines was severely affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. But don't you guys be complaining because not only did we have the pandemic like everywhere else, we also had a volcanic eruption, earthquakes, strong typhoons, and devastating floods. And by the way, apparently none of these were turned back by any kind of divine intervention. But then he says, here came the words of the prophet like a pillar of light shining through dark clouds of fear, loneliness, and despair. They included the call for worldwide fasting and prayer. That's where he mentioned it, right? Yeah. They he doesn't say he doesn't say what it was for, by the way, okay? So he's yeah. getting kind of close to the cliff, but he's still staying far enough away. He's not going to fall over. He doesn't say what the worldwide fasting and prayer was for, but then he says, and counsel, this is all one sentence, and counsel to move forward despite the pandemic. Now, that's a wonderful sentence because in this one sentence, there's these two conflicting things. The first is the worldwide days of fasting and prayer, right? Yep. To turn back the pandemic. That was the first part of the council. And then the second part of the council is, well, when that didn't work, to move forward despite the pandemic. Yep. Yep. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So uh, let's see here. Um, it's, it's another one of those switch things where like, you know, ahead of the time when we're fasting for healing and for recovery from this pandemic. And then afterwards it's, well, we fasted so that we'd be able to deal with the tragedy of the pandemic. Yes. What he doesn't yeah. say is that the council to move forward despite the pandemic was given only after the two days of fasting and prayer didn't work. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now we get to the same talk now, <laughs> I'm pretty sure same talk timestamp 6.27. Oh, another horrible story. Did I mention there's a lot of sad stories in this uh, session? Uh, you did. Let's see. So we're at timestamp 627. Let's yes. take it away. Hold on. Now, here he tells a story, by the way, where anybody, any reasonable person would be mad, would be very angry, would be very upset. And he is. But then he realizes he shouldn't be because Jesus. Okay. Uh, let's go back to normal. And so we can hear him at the normal rate. And here we go. 
In 2016, while serving a mission in Little Rock, Arkansas, I asked Brother Dava to deliver a package to my older sister who lived on an island in Fiji. His response was not something that I had anticipated. President Wakolo, he groaned, your sister passed away and was buried 10 days ago. I had self-pity and even felt a little upset that my family did not even bother to let me know. No kidding. The next day, while my wife was teaching missionaries, this thought penetrated my soul. Daniela, all these experiences are for your own good and development. You have been teaching and sharing your testimony about the atonement of Jesus Christ. Now live accordingly. I was reminded that happy is the man whom God corrects. Therefore, we should despise not the chastening of the Almighty. It was a spiritual surgery for me, and the outcome was immediate. Okay, there you go. So what do you think of this story, Jonathan? Would you be mad if you were in that situation? Absolutely. Uh, that is a heart-wrenching story. Yeah, I mean, my gosh. Hey, would you deliver this package to my sister in Fiji? Uh, well, hey, tell you this, but she passed away. And uh, her she was buried 10 days ago, right? So she actually passed away before 10 days ago. But she was buried 10 days ago. What? Didn't your family let you know? <laughs> and he's going, uh, no, they didn't let me know. So I think this is a very natural reaction and an appropriate reaction to be very upset about it. But then there's part of this idea in Mormonism and maybe in other uh, Christian religions that um, we have to suppress our very natural feelings of uh, being upset, of being angry at other people because of what they've done or what they haven't done. We have to suppress that in the name of trying to be like our perception of Jesus, um, who wasn't always uh, acting that way, by the way. But that's our perception. We need to uh, suppress that. And I think part of the problem of that is that instead of expressing his anger to his family, which apparently he doesn't do, he just suppresses it, that when you suppress these negative kinds of feelings, that eventually they're going to come out in some way or other. And it may be down the line. It may be manifesting itself or erupting in a situation completely having nothing to do with this incident about the sister passing away. And it may not even come up in the context of his family members. It might be, I mean, kicking the dog. Sorry, Yu-Gi-Oh! Or something else to someone else. Maybe his wife, maybe his kids. But it will come up. And if it doesn't come up, then it's just going to sit inside and mess with him internally. Yeah. And, you know, it strikes me. He's talking about just a handful of years ago when he was a mission president. And we all have heard stories of missionaries, young men, who go out and then some tragedy happens back home. And there, there's this struggle. Do I go back home and leave my mission? Do I stay on my mission? You know, the, the, the missionary who's out and his mother yeah. passes away or something like that. And there's always this thing, I think, um, where the the priorities then come to a head because you have a young man who has to choose between what should be a very high priority in terms of taking care of his grieving family being there in their moment of loss um sharing that experience that major life milestone with them or being out and serving the lord in their mission and and they're kind of put in this bind where if they choose to prioritize their family then what they're doing is they're saying that they're selfish and they're not really committed to God. Yeah, and, and I'm familiar. Well, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I, what are your thoughts on that? Because I, I've heard that story over and over again. Yeah, and let's just go ahead and be honest, okay? As two members of the church um, who have a little bit of time under our belt, we've heard of these things happening. We may have experienced them or seen other people go through them. We know what the righteous response is. Mm -hmm. The righteous response is you stay on your mission. Yeah. And it may be said, oh, well, you know, it's okay. You have a choice, but we know what the righteous choice is. We stay on our mission and let the funeral go on without us. That's the righteous choice. And if you take the choice of going home for the funeral, it's understandable, but it is not as righteous. Yeah. And, but this, this shows me though, that that type of pressure, that type of bind even exists at the level of the mission president, because it's happening here. And it's fascinating to me. He chastens himself. I think the fact that he has to contextualize what happened as being chastened and corrected by God is that he acknowledges he was mad. He was pissed. 
He felt like his family should have told him and he should have been given a chance to be there at that moment of grief, even just to see her being lowered into the ground. And he was mad about it and he had to be, he had to be corrected and repent in his mind and God chastened him. Um, and I have a few more things to say about that, but what is your take on that part of his story? My take on it is probably he wouldn't have been able to go for the, the funeral. Uh, maybe they make exceptions. They probably do. They do for missionaries, like you mentioned. But generally, you know, mission presidents got to stay within the boundaries of their mission yeah. for the entire three years, regardless. But just, I mean, to know, to know, to have your family tell you that your sister had died and they don't. Yeah. The thing that struck me about that part where he's saying, um, happy is the man whom God corrects. Um, I was reminded the happy is the man whom God corrects. Therefore, we should despise not the chastening of the Almighty. And I want to tell this brother, if I could speak to him directly, I would say, you know, it's okay to be mad at your family for not telling you your sister had passed away and was buried 10 days ago. And then my other question is, why do you see this as God correcting you? I mean, you're not the one who died. Yeah. Yeah. So the, 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 the other uh, point that this struck me as was um, the the fake apology on racism that I published a few years ago. To you much, did that? Uh, you did that? <laughs> ha. Um, one of the aspects that I included was a context for the prophets of the church themselves to be corrected and to find in that correction further affirmation of faith. And so this concept, if you go back and read the words of that apology, it was put there very specifically, which is that whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And so the idea that the leaders, the highest leaders of the church could be subject to correction and chastisement can be contextualized in the faith as a sign of God's love and favor, and that the leaders of the church should be open to correction and chastisement, acknowledging fault acknowledging that they were wrong and that they need to correct themselves because that can be a sign of God's favor as this leader has done himself in trying to come to terms with the contradiction between his feelings in that moment of grief and how he knows he's supposed to behave as a mission president. But um, that's just where, you know, these things can get a certain level of understanding, but if you don't apply them in all different levels, then they lose some of their efficacy as a, um, as a religion that could grab onto some helpful aspects of right. the scriptural tradition. Yeah, we certainly trot out the story of Joseph Smith being chastised by the Lord for losing the 116 pages off enough, enough don't we? Yeah, and, and which brings brings me to my mind. I think when he's saying these experiences are for your own good and development, he's invoking a little bit of the, uh, the letter from Liberty Jail, which had that same type of sentiment to give strength to Joseph Smith when he felt like God had deserted him. Yes. It also leads you to the fact that if you're faithful and bad things happen to you, then it's because God loves you. Yeah. It's a win-win for the church. It's totally and a win-win for God. If, if yeah. good things are happening, God loves you. If bad things are happening, he loves you because God chastens whom he loves. Yeah. Okay. Maybe we can get through this next talk by the end because we're at 843 by my time. And that's probably yeah. 1043 by your time. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, yep. This is Elder Chi Hong Wong, and apparently he goes by the nickname Sam because that's there in parentheses. And his talk is, they cannot prevail, we cannot fall. I guess all the good titles were taken. So here, <laughs> here he goes down to timestamp 5.55, and here he gives a little um, paragraph about how all-consuming Mormonism is in the lives of its members, at least its good members. Okay, let's take a look. All right, we're going to go to timestamp 555. Brothers, oh, hold on. Pandemic. That's, that's the old one. Uh, there we go. How we. All right, 555. Some of us may think the gospel is good, so we need to put it in our lives. Maybe once a week. Just going to church once a week is not enough to build upon the rock. 
Our entire life should be filled with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Did you slow this down, Jonathan? The gospel is not part of our lives, but our lives is actually part of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Think about it. Is that not true? Our mortal life is only part of the whole plan of salvation and exaltation. Okay, stop, stop, you're killing me. God this is, is like a water torture that you're putting me through here. Did you slow that down? Did you slow that down, Jonathan? I can't hear you. No, that, that was normal speed. Wow. But oh my the thing is, we got used to listening to things faster. So when you go back to normal, it's like when you're like when I'm listening to you and Bill Real, like I have to pause because I'm working or whatever. And then I just put it on twice speed and it catches up. And so you and Bill Real are like, and hey, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. And then it hits live. And it's like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, maybe that's it. But boy, all of a sudden, I'm just like, come on, come on. Um, but he says the gospel is not part of our life, but our life is actually part of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Think about it. Is that not true? Our mortal life is only part of the whole plan of salvation and exaltation. So in other words, our entire lives, as he says, should be filled with the gospel of Jesus Christ, which means Mormonism in the morning, Mormonism in the evening, Mormonism at supper time. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so <laughs> well, anytime, anytime, he, like, so there's this great clip from Elder Bednar that I think this guy is probably inspired from that I, I just, I have to um, bring. Does it up. have to do with a pickle? No, <laughs> thank goodness. But let's take a look of it because it, it, it tells him, it tells us where he got this from a little bit. Church of Jesus Christ is not a social organization. And it's not just about what we do for society. It can and should be the doctrine, the authority, the ordinance, and covenants are the central focus of our lives. If they are not, I urge you to consider your ways. Being a member of this church affects everything. Where you go, where you don't go. What you think, what you don't think. What you speak, what you don't speak. What you eat, what you drink, what you wear. There is no aspect of your life 24 7 that is influenced by your discipleship and devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. If it is less than that, you are living far below your privileges in the gospel. It is not a burden. It is not a chore. It is the only source of enduring joy, purpose, and direction. Holy cow. What a find. You're amazing. By the way, um, devoting your entire life to Mormonism is not a burden. <laughs> well, if you think it's a burden, then something's wrong with you. It's not a chore. It's a joy, damn it. Yeah. The beatings will continue until morale improves. <laughs> hashtag, it's not a burden. Or ha <laughs> yeah. uh, hashtag, Mormonism is not a burden. We'll get something here. So that's great. Um, uh, so let's see if we can go down to... Let's see, we're at 848. That was the only thing I wanted to play from that individual's talks. Individual's okay. talk. Now we go to Our Personal Savior by Elder Michael John U. T. -E -H. Okay. What think ye of Christ? Oh, this is an interesting uh, story. Timestamp 00 00.22. All right, let's do it. 022. At least this isn't a sad story. <laughs> okay. Nobody dies here. I am grateful to be with you, resurrected, and he lives. 34 years ago, my missionary companion and I met and taught a very intellectual man who was a contributing writer in a local newspaper in Davao City in the Philippines. We enjoyed teaching him because he had a lot of questions and was very respectful of our beliefs. The most memorable question he asked us was, what think ye of Christ? We, of course, excitedly shared our feelings and bore testimony of Jesus Christ. He later published an article on the same topic that contained wonderful words and phrases about the Savior. I remember being impressed, but not necessarily lifted. It had good information, but felt hollow and lacked spiritual power. There you go. Okay, so I had all these comments here, but the thing that struck me as I was listening to it this time is how anti-intellectual this story is mm -hmm. in other words uh, he even uses uh, that word doesn't he, he says um, 
Yeah, 34 years ago, my missionary companion and I met and taught a very intellectual man. Yeah. And he wants to know what we think about Jesus. And so we tell him, and then he writes an article, and he says this article uh, contained many wonderful words and phrases about the Savior. I remember being impressed, but not necessarily lifted. You see, because even though he's intellectual, and maybe because he's intellectual, he cannot talk about Jesus with spiritual power. That's what he says. It had good information, but felt hollow and lacked spiritual power. Now, that's certainly his uh, impression of it, and he's certainly welcome to it. I'm not here to argue with him about it. I'm just here to say that this story is told in such a way as to be anti-intellectualism. In other words, intellectualism and spirituality do not go together necessarily. They're like oil and water. Yeah, all it's missing is the so-called, before the word intellectual man. <laughs> and so-called intellectuals. That's yeah, funny. That was, that was a fun thing that you can do is go to that corpus of general conference talks and just search for so-called and you'll find all the things that the church hates. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah, just call it so-called. You know, there's other things going on here. We only have nine minutes, but one of the things that's going on here is this idea that, um, you know, anything the church does is perfect by virtue of the fact that it's the church doing it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if President Nelson is saying, oh, I'll see your mother in, you know, this the spirit world, right? That's fantastic. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. But if somebody who's not a member, but who's intellectual writes about the savior, ah, sorry, no spiritual power there. So let me just say is that we set up a paradigm where only what is said by leaders can lift us. Yeah. But the irony is that what the leaders say is typically what I personally find hollow and lacking in spiritual power. Uh, reference this entire session of General Conference. Um, there's, so, there's a spiritual arrogance that's central to all of this, which is like... Mormons want to be respected. They want to have their values, their beliefs respected. They want their temple ceremonies and ordinance all to be respected as sacred, and they want the world to respect them on that. But when it comes to acknowledging the, severe, the sincere conviction and sacred nature of some other faith's expression of love, gratitude, and faith about Christ as their savior or any other religious paradigm, well, that's just hollow and it doesn't really have spiritual power. And it's just this kind of spiritual arrogance that infuses Mormonism that you don't even see because you're you're tied, you're stuck in, well, my church is legitimate, all the other churches are not legitimate when you're in the Mormon paradigm. But when you step away of that and you and then you realize, wait a second, you know, all these different churches are really just kind of struggling to find meaning, to find connection. They're looking for meaning and a spiritual existence. And so you kind of can give them their own legitimacy and validity to the extent that they're not, you know, stepping on the objective world or whatever. Uh, it just, it reminds, it, 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 it it woke up my eyes to how spiritually arrogant I was as a Mormon and the church itself is when I look back on it. Right. And there's this disparity between how Mormons present about how they feel about their religion and different aspects of it and how they really feel about it. And no time mm. was that more clear when church went from three hours to two hours. Yes. And the cheers went up throughout Mormondom. Never before have I seen so many people so glad to have less of something that they love so much. So much. <laughs> right? So yes. that was a great time. And also the temple. I mean, how many times do we have to hear Mormons go on and on about how wonderful the temple is? And then you go to the temple and you find out that really, meh, it's warmed over masonry. It's not even that, it's not that great. It, it does not withstand multiple viewings. And yet that's what we are condemned to do in order to prove our worthiness and righteousness. Yeah. Oh, we we're at 654 or 854. Well, what do we we got time for the rest of this this particular talk, I think. Do you What's think so? Next? Okay, think so, so let's do it. Okay, da, 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 timestamp 2.06. This is important why. That's not important. We'll skip that. 2.38 okay. is important because okay, yeah, do this one. Now, and notice something. Notice what comes up out of the blue here. This is what's interesting. Close quote. Second, as we are increasingly coming to know the Savior, scriptural passages and the words of the prophets become so intimately meaningful to us that they become our own words. It is not about copying the words and feelings and experiences of others as much as it is coming to know for ourselves in our own unique way by experimenting upon the word and receiving a witness from the Holy Ghost. Okay. So 
all of a sudden, and if you read this in context, which I have done and listened to it a number of times, there is nothing that prepares the listener for this idea he brings up about copying or plagiarism. It's a remarkable thing. This is what happens in so many talks, and this is a great example of it, is where there's something on the speaker's mind, but he doesn't want to tell you what it's about. In other words, he's not going to set up the issue and tell you what it is he's addressing. He's just mm -hmm. going to sort of give an answer to it. It's like telling the punchline of a joke without telling the joke. And nobody gets what the heck you're talking about. It's not yeah. funny. You have to actually say, why are you talking all of a sudden about copying the words? He, sa he says, it is not about copying the words. He hasn't talked about copying before this. Yeah. And he's already answering this question. And it leads me to think, well, let me ask you, what does it lead you to think, Jonathan? What's on this guy's mind? Uh, well, it's on his mind of, there's two different things. One of them is that, you know, some maybe some people have accused either the brethren or other people of simply just repeating somebody else's thing or living on someone else's testimony. Or it's like, well, you haven't really seen Christ. You're not, you know, you're a special witness to the name of Christ, not actual Christ. Or you're just copying and repeating what your predecessors have done. It's not real testimony, not real witness. And I think the second part of it is it reminds me, I believe, of um, McConkie's last address, where he talked about that he's using the words testifying of Christ that maybe you'll recognize in the Bible, but he's come to know them for himself now, and now they are his words authentically, legitimately from himself. Mm -hmm. And and that reminds me of the paradigm that he's talking here. Well, I will tell you that um, my immersion for a decade in Mormon apologetics may be informing my reaction to this, mm. because what yeah. I... It's a very common response. I mean, the, the issue, which he's not talking about, the issue is, why is the Bible copied so much in the Book of Mormon? Oh, yeah. Why is the Bible copied so much in the Doctrine and Covenants? The question you of know? plagiarism. Yes. And why are all these phrases from the Bible appearing there? And this is one of the common apologetic answers. Now, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense if you think about it more than three seconds. But the idea is that, well, these are just words that are now ours. And so we can speak them as if they originate with us. You know, it's not copying. It's just, right. well, it ends up being copying anyway. Yeah. That's the problem with the argument, right? It's yep. not copying, it's just borrowing for a long while. Um, but yeah, so, he's, so he says, second is we are increasingly coming to know the Savior. Scriptural passages, right? That's what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. And the words mm -hmm. of the prophets become so intimately meaningful to us that they become our own words. It is not about copying the words, feelings, and experiences of others as much as it is coming to know for ourselves in our own you, unique way. So this comes out of nowhere. It fades immediately into oblivion. And mm -hmm. he leaves us to guess at what it is he's talking about. And I think that's a pretty good guess as to what it is he's talking about. We are at 858 now. There's only one other little thing there, and I know you've got to go, but we are at the end of his talk. And then the last talk, which I figured we would not get to, is okay. the closing talk by President Russell M. Nelson, which we can deal with do next have, time. Do we have time for the last timestamp you have marked on this one, or is it important well, enough to... If you do timestamp 5.33, you're going to notice that he's doing something else here, I think. Um, yeah, go ahead. He's Let's talking about more things, but uh, you'll hear the story. I won't. I won't uh, introduce it. Okay. Years ago, at the invitation of my file leader, I read the Book of Mormon from cover to cover and marked the verses that reference the Lord's atonement. He also invited me to prepare a one-page summary of what I learned. I said to myself, "One page? Sure, that is easy." To my surprise, however, I found the task to be extremely difficult, and I failed. I have since realized I failed because I missed the mark and have incorrect assumptions. First, I expected the summary to be inspiring to everyone. The summary was meant for me and not for anyone else. It was meant to capture my feelings and emotions about the Savior and what He has done for me so that every time I read it, it will bring to the surface wonderful, poignant, and personal spiritual experiences. Second, I expected the summary to be grand and elaborate and contain big words and phrases. It was never about big words. It was meant to be a clear and simple declaration of conviction. Quote, for my soul delighteth in plainness, for after his manner that the Lord God work among the children of men, for the Lord God giveth light unto the understanding. 
Third, I expected it to be perfect, a summary to end all summaries, a final summary that one cannot and should not add to, instead of a work in progress that I can add a word here or a phrase there as my understanding of Jesus Christ's atonement increases. There you go. And so that was his story. Now, this is a strange story, and I won't belabor the point here, okay? But we could analyze this for longer time than we have. But why is he telling this story, I wonder? And why is he making these strange assumptions about a one-page summary? A one-page seems incredibly short for a summary of, uh, if you read the Book of Mormon cover to cover and mark all the verses that reference the Lord's Atonement, oh, and do a one-page summary. That sounds pretty darn difficult. But he says he failed, and he failed for three reasons. And what I'm wondering here is, is he talking only about his summary, or is he extending the lessons he learned from failing in writing the summary to issues that might be raised regarding the Book of Mormon, okay? First, I expected the summary to be inspiring to everyone. What do we do with people who read the Book of Mormon and pray about it and don't feel the gift of the Holy Ghost or the Holy Ghost testifying to them? Well, it's not inspiring to everyone, okay? I expected the summary to be inspiring to everyone. Two, second, I expected the summary to be grand and elaborate and contain big words and phrases. Okay, so maybe the Book of Mormon, especially in the original form, the 1830 original version, uh, has backwards rustic syntax, vocabulary, Mm -hmm. and spelling. So, and even quotes from the Book of Mormon there in support of the idea that my soul delighteth in plainness, right? And then third, which is also, I think, most interesting. Third, I expected it to be perfect. A summary to end all summaries. I don't know why he would expect that. A final summary that one cannot and should not add to instead of a work in progress to which I can add a word here or a phrase there as my understanding of Jesus Christ's atonement increases. Why would he have this expectation about his Um, his one-page summary. Maybe that's all he's talking about, but it strikes me that this also falls in line with the idea that he's dealing with why was uh, the Book of Mormon changed in subsequent editions? Mm -hmm. Why were words changed? Why is the Doctrine and Covenants and Revelations contained in there, uh, most notably, I think, probably section 27 of the Doctrine and Covenants, and words added and changed over time? Because It's the expectation that's wrong. The expectation is that it would be perfect, but the reality is it's a work in progress that can be added to and should be added to, and to which can be added a word here or a phrase there as the understanding of Jesus Christ's atonement increases. So I think that what the speaker's doing is he's dealing with a lot of apologetic issues, and what he's doing is he's telling us all the answers without telling us what the problems are. And frequently that leads to confusion, and I, Maybe I'm reading too much into this. I don't know. But I do think I'm onto something because everything that he's saying falls under the heading of an answer to certain issues relating to the scriptures of the Latter-day Saints, the Doctrine and Covenants yeah. particularly, and the Book of Mormon. Yeah. It almost, when you take that first clip that we did and this one, the first clip so, sort of says like, okay, so if you're if you're adopting words from the prophets and other scriptures, then that's okay. And then this one's saying, if you're trying to summarize and get the story in, then it's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be hugely eloquent and it's a work in progress. Now that's kind of setting the groundwork for us in the future saying, well, maybe the book of Mormon, like the book of Abraham was an act of, um, you know, this, this catalyst theory where uh, he was inspired to write it. It wasn't a direct translation, and therefore all of these different caveats apply. And then we can even take um, the Givens idea of bricolage, where he's taking bits from scripture and from other things, assembling them together into something that points to Christ and has all of these very human, very real failings. And we can now see the Book of Mormon as scripture produced in that mode rather than a literal translation. And it, it all makes sense. So I can I can hear that there. That was a brilliant summary. I have nothing that I can right. add to that. <laughs> okay, well, we are getting to the end. I do want to uh, close with, I was able to find that image of... <laughs> Pastor Bob of, of Pastor Bob, because you got to This is just such a brilliant cartoon. Uh, you've got a stage. It says buy Pastor Bob's book, you know, in, in b- 
banners everywhere, Pastor Bob, Pastor Bob, Pastor Bob, and everything's Pastor Bob. And then at the bottom, it has Pastor Bob saying, let's give glory to God. And we just <laughs> saw that so many times in this talk where, you know, the heavens parted, the light came down, and it was the words of the prophet that gave me inspiration on Easter when things are actually supposed to be about Christ. But anyway, I'm going to close You know, that was that. interesting. That, no, I, not <laughs> no. quite yet. No, that okay. was really interesting, the point you made, because what that speaker said, and we played it, was yeah. that... The pillar of light came down. Who's in the pillar yeah. of light? It's Jesus in 1832. And by 1838, it's God and Jesus. It's God. And then the pillar of light that comes down is the words of President Nelson. Yes, exactly. This is the apotheosis of Russell M. Nelson. <laughs> Yeah, and just, you know, as soon as he kicks the bucket, it'll be the apotheosis of the next guy. So, oh, yeah, all right, well, I got to close it down. And uh, thank you again. And next time we will catch President Nelson's final remarks and then a good the one. afternoon session. All right, excellent. So until next time, this has been Talk on Things and Stuff, hashtag Lazy Learners.